So I ended up being a back end guy. And back then, the programming language of choice, if you weren't doing stuff in C, you were doing it in Perl. And so I read the book multiple times on Perl. And that introduced me to data. And when I came here, I was a systems guy, I helped with PeopleSoft implementation, but more on the server side and under the covers. But I did that probably only for a year and then um, was brought into the data. And I thought, man, why, why am I being punished? Um, but I uh, haven't looked back and I've enjoyed it ever since. And I don't claim to be uh, the master knowledge of anything, but especially not a functional user uh, or a functional um, wizard or knight or anything like that. But I enjoy working with people who know their data and uh, want to do something with it. And I love helping make things um, work and make things easier. But I always need somebody to tell me more about what that data is and what it means and what they want to do with it. So that's me, Jason Green, and I'm gonna let Zach introduce himself. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Zach Walker. I've been working with uh, UTO slash ET for uh, less time than Jason, certainly only about three years. Um, over in the data analysis and visualization chapter, been having a great time with uh, Mike Sharkey and Elizabeth Riley. Uh, quick side note, I can't see the audience. So I'm just gonna imagine that you're all, you know, clapping, going crazy, uh, like you're the crowd at the Phillies game last night uh, at all possible times. It really helps get me excited. Um, and yeah, we're going to be talking today about the uh, super data type. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. I know the Zoom folks can. Uh, hopefully everyone in the room can as well. We can see you. Um, so what area do you work in, Zach? Yeah, so I do data analysis and visualization. It's uh, a lot of Tableau. Um, that's 80 to 90% of my day to day. Sprinkle in a little bit of Alteryx every now and then. Um, there's definitely a lot of SQL. Um, but yeah, mostly Tableau dashboards. Um, I've done some work with the mobile app, uh, with the chatbot, with the health check. So if you've ever seen any of those, uh, that was probably me. And if you have any questions about any of those, feel free to reach out to me on Slack. Oh, yeah. So uh, we kind of already started through this, but this is, uh, we, we wanted to conform with how these presentations have been going. So we have an agenda slide and the agenda is that we're going to talk about this stuff. Um, so this is, this is what they look like when they come into the data program here. Uh, and this is what they look like after a couple of years, just a couple of years. I had a full, full head of hair and it was black. Um, See, much like the before and during slash after. Yeah, all right, Zach. So who's studying this stuff? I think this is you. This is me, yeah. Um, so first, we just want to walk you through sort of what semi-structured data is, is that's going to be uh, important in a few minutes. Um, so semi-structured data can be sometimes pretty difficult to understand, um, but structured data, let's start with that. Um, so we have a, a sort of foundation to build on is data that comes out of an application with that is complete and has sort of an instruction manual for a database. Um, for instance, if you were to look at a database that has like information on people who have driver's license, says um, everyone in that database would have a first name. Everyone in that database would have a last name and the state of their driver's license and their address and their date of expiration, et cetera. Um, so everyone in that database has values for all of the different possible columns in that database. Um, and in a perfect world, any time that data would come in or out of that database, the data would have some metadata associated with it to say like first name is a string, uh, last name is a string, state is a string that's only going to be two characters long because we're using abbreviations. Uh, the expiration date is a date time, um, just sort of telling the database or the user what the data type is um, that's coming in. So that's that's structured data. Um, unstructured data is the complete opposite of that. Um, most like super big data sets like petabyte scale are uh, unstructured because it's much easier to store. Um, but that is essentially like just throw every possible piece of information into a row um, and just leave it at that. There's not really necessarily any such things as different columns for different attributes. It's just stick it all in a row, call it a day. Um, 
So semi-structured data is what we're looking at on this slide. It's in between. Um, so it doesn't contain metadata about what the data fields are, um, but it does give you uh, key value pairs typically. So that's what these are. Um, these are a couple different examples of things from the ASU mobile app data feed. Um, both of these are live cards, which are those things that pop up at the very top um, and show you stuff like news that's happening. Um, for a while, your health check was bumped to the top of that, if you remember those uh, super fun days. Um, so these are two examples of uh, data from the mobile app, like I said. Um, and they're organized in key value pairs. Um, so we've got, for instance, uh, on the right side here, we've got the, uh, the S uh, in quotation marks there, and then colon uh, 29159, um, or S colon ASU Gamage to feature the photography of Gina Santi. Um, so the ASU Gamage to feature the photography of Gina Santi is the value, and then S is the key. And so together, they make up a key value pair. Um, and you can sort of see how that might translate to a database. Um, if there was a column example, for example, that was called S, then ASU Gamage to feature blah, 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 would show up as the value for that column. Um, but one of the nice things about semi-structured data and one of the things that makes it appropriate, for example, for the ASU mobile app is that you don't have to have uh, all the same columns with the same values. Um, so like we talked about with driver's licenses, everyone will have a first name, et cetera. That isn't necessarily the case for all uh, sets of data. Um, so, like I said, these are two these are two live cards um, with two drastically different data feeds coming out of them. Um, so that's where we find semi-structured data useful is we can play around with, okay, like we don't need to have uh, everything. We just need to have whatever the data the application decides that we need, and then we stick it in a field. Um, for instance, the field that these come into is called action metadata. And so that's where we dump all of the stuff that doesn't necessarily, conform to every possible data feed coming from that application. Um, and that's uh, super helpful for, like I said, stuff like that, where not everything is going to be exactly the same. So moving right along here, um, there are some more complex structures than what I just showed. Um, so what we were looking at on the previous slide, actually, I'll jump back to that for just a quick second. Uh, the way that this data is set up is called uh, JSON, uh, not to be confused with my fellow presenter. It uh, stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and that's just the key value pairs inside of the brackets. Um, it's just the format of the file. Um, so those can be nested. Uh, so for example, actually, I'm going to jump back to the previous slide again, because we have an example of it here. Um, on the left side, there's that target ID. Uh, so that's a key and then a colon. So we know after the colon comes the value and the value itself is a key value pair. So that's an example of uh, some nested JSON, um, but it can get super complicated. Um, stuff can get nested across multiple levels. Um, and the primary use case for what we'll be talking about today, the super data type uh, is for document signing data. Um, so we have data from uh, DocuSign uh, and now also Adobe Sign, which is the, the newer product there. Um, and that's all coming in in the form of uh, these super data types. Um, so if we take a look at the left-hand uh, screenshot here, that is an example row from the Adobe Sign Agreements table. Um, and we can see we've got uh, most of the way down here, we've got form data, participants, that's info, and webhook logs. Um, and those little icons to the left of those that if you're a DB or user, maybe you're not familiar with, like you would be the rest of them, but that denotes that it's a super data type, which essentially means it's got JSON in it. It's got semi-structured data in it. Um, so that's what we're going to get into today is how does that show up in the data warehouse and how do we get stuff out of that? Um, but this is a good example of that because, for instance, uh, one set of, one group that uses Adobe Sign is not going to have the same fields on their forms as another group. Um, like the, the people that I analyze a lot of this data for, um, the Office of Clinical Partnership, uh, are people who handle internships for credit. And so their forms are not going to have the same fields that, for instance, the study abroad office, who I believe also uses uh, this product, would have on their forms because they're, you know, doing two separate things. Um, but they all end up in the same table, and that's where we find this semi-structured data useful. Uh, I think, Jason, you are up. Okay, good. So it, this, 
I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, Redshift, what it is, Amazon Redshift. It is relevant to um, the message that we're sharing here. But um, yeah, just a little, little background. What is Redshift? It's something that's been used. I mean, when you connect to the data warehouse, what you're connecting to is um, an Amazon Redshift database. Um, one of the, the interesting parts about it, it's um, so this is those first few bullet points are, I mean, directly from the AWS website, fully managed. And that's significant. One of the great benefits that we have from what we do today to what we did before there was Redshift. We were an Oracle system and it's great. I mean, I loved it. And that's where I learned a lot of things. But um, it started to, we started to reach some of the limitations, especially on table sizes and things like that. But also, um, even though we spend a lot of money today on this product, it is roughly one eighth of the cost of what we spend on our previous house installation, right? And that's pretty much the database, the support. One of the cool things about being fully managed is we budgeted in resources to, um, you know, like DBAs, but you don't need DBAs to get this thing running. Um, you know, myself and a couple of others, we, we just keep the thing alive. And in the three or more years that we've been using it, there have been two, um, uh, I would call them dramatic events um, that took place um, that caused some outage. And they just happened to be this last month that that occurred. Um, but apart from that, the thing runs itself. There's a lot of learning that goes on behind the scenes. And uh, just so you're aware, when you run a query once, the database figures out what you're doing and it, and it presents the results to you, but it learns. So as you, if you repeat the same query over and over again, it will optimize the data. And what I mean by that is it shifts it around in the way that it stores the data such that the next time somebody comes to run a query similar to yours or you run it again, the data is often, but not always, but often moved into a structure slash organization that makes it easier uh, for you to, or quicker for that query to run again and again, right? So that's all part of their thing, petabyte scale. Um, so tables in Oracle, that you just couldn't, we couldn't query anymore. I mean, there was, they were just too big, but that was approaching the uh, hundreds of millions of rows when it started to get, and it depends how big the, the table was, right? If there's only two columns in there, then that's not big at all. But um, some of the bigger tables just became unusable. Um, but in Redshift, I mean, we have tables in the uh, many billions of rows that um, it's not, super responsive, but you will get a result. And sometimes it might take minutes. I see some queries out there running for hours, um, but they're usually, uh, Paul Alvarado, no, just kidding. Um, they're usually uh, when you're joining multiple tables, maybe some of the Ed Plus people now that they're moving in there probably jam us up a little, but the database, Redshift takes care of it and helps out. And like I say, this is relevant to our topic today. So I thought I would bring that up. Um, we are, the, the data warehouse in at ASU was first put together in 1992. Um, and that was on a Sybase. And then around 2006 slash seven, around that time frame when we went live with PeopleSoft, um, it was migrated to the same systems that PeopleSoft was on. And it was maintained and managed there. That was Oracle. And with the go live of Workday financials, um, that's when we started this uh, redshift migration. Um, and I think the next slide, Zach, also helps us, again, to bear in mind, uh, this is some background relevance to what we're gonna talk about, but this is the uh, enterprise technology data I don't know what you want to call it. It's architecture. I don't know about strategy, but this is how things work. Um, in S3 buckets, right? That a lot of data sits there, files. Um, we have this Redshift Enterprise Data Warehouse. And then a companion is the operational data store. And so those kind of three things work 
together to make up. Um, there's other components as well, but as far as um, what the enterprise people support and present and make available, those are the three things. So Redshift is typically for data that's updated nightly, data stores there, it's accumulated, there's larger structures, operational data store is more for um, quicker queries or applications, they connect to that, and then the bucket is where files go. Um, please feel free to stop me at any time, ask a question, or Zach. Um, oh yeah, so I wanted to spend some time again on this. Um, so there's different file types, and the way that data is loaded into Redshift, into our data warehouse, there's no inserts, right? There's no um, data is extracted from source systems, but it's not inserted like you would in a SQL statement, right? Insert into table these values. Instead, data is uh, sucked directly from files. It is possible to do that insert, but it's not practical. It will take forever. So instead we put files, well, files are placed by other applications. It doesn't have to be the data warehouse team, or I mean, it could be any team. And there are multiple different teams that place files in that uh, Amazon um, S3 space, right? Buckets, there's files out there. So data is um, sucked or copied, copied is the term that they use, ingested directly from those files. There is nothing that is done to um, data outside of the database that is done with inserts. It's all used this copy. Once it's in there, then stuff is shifted around and there's inserts and stuff like that. But all data coming into the warehouse comes in through files and it's much, much faster. Also, uh, Redshift is uh, columnar and multi um, nodes. So it kind of does things in, in parallel and that's what makes it a lot faster. Um, Basic file types, right? CSV fixed with this JSON that was just introduced to us. And another something that we use somewhat is uh, Parquet. Um, there's these other file types here, and they are, like I said, columnar is what how uh, Redshift thinks in data, which means when you look at uh, Excel spreadsheet, for instance, you see rows and columns. It doesn't store things as a row. In Redshift, it stores things as columns which has some advantages and some disadvantages, but some of the advantages, especially when you, you've got filters going on with tables, um, it's easier. It's also very good at compressing things because all the stuff in the same column would be the same data type. And so it just compresses easy. Um, these are different data types. Parquet is particularly good and probably the fastest, but it also is very difficult when you're operating with other systems. So when we're passing data around to ourselves, um, Parquet is a good way to do it um, for unloading from one system and loading into another database somewhere else for ourselves. We use that, but um, JSON is fastly becoming um, easy because um, it handles things when it breaks. So JSON, it, it, there's kind of uh, sometimes data, data will show up in a JSON file, um, but it's not consistent, right? The, the data could change based on what the application is doing or thinking. As Zach said, with the Adobe sign, you can build an Adobe sign, sign it form and put all the fields that you want on with another department or another team or another person builds a completely different form and they put the type of things that they want on. This comes in the same set of files, JSON files. So it has to be interpreted um, differently. Now that doesn't work with CSV. CSVs have to line up. When you load it, it has to line up exactly. And if one field is missing, it's going to break because it's expecting the thing to go in there and it's not there. Or if there's an additional field, it will break because it's saying, hey, I don't know what to do with this extra thing that you got here. JSON solves a lot of that. As long as a key field um, is not adjusted, renamed, or missing, uh, you can load it. There, there might be empty columns, but it will load it. And so, um, maybe this is too much information, but under the scenes, we use this JSON format um, increasingly more. And that's what systems are generally producing anyway, is this JSON format when, we, when you go out to fetch data. 
So, um, yep. Thanks, Zach. Uh, this is something that uh, Zach had already shown, right? We have nested JSON, so it's got all sorts of things. It's not just what we, what I would call a flat uh, structure, where it's just um, key values and uh, just at one level. This goes in um, and in and out and in and out. In this particular data set, it's not the same one that Zach uses and is going to show you again, but there are two main top level things, this metadata up the top there and this body, and the metadata can contain things and the body can contain things. Um, this happens to come from the Canvas live events. And so there are in actuality, uh, close to 300 different columns that's available. I just took a, a minor sample of that, but just to illustrate that, depending on what the event is, and this happens to be a uh, event name quizzes item updated. So this is a quiz that was updated, and this is what the, the data that comes in for that. If you were um, checking a grade, or a grade was applied, it would be a different set. So it just depends, right? So that goes back to what Zach said, just depends on what you're doing and what you're giving. Okay, Zach, I'm supposed to um, jump through these pretty quick, but there are different methods for getting that data into Redshift. One of them is creating an external table. An external table means the data isn't loaded into Redshift. It sits out in that S3 bucket in that uh, data lake somewhere and Redshift points at it. And for that particular data set that I just showed, this is how I would build that external table. And it works, but it's kind of ugly. And when you go to query it, eh, it's, it's not good. You, I mean, the first thing when people say, oh, there's this table out there, I wanna go look and see what it is. You select star from this table and you can look at it and say, oh, this is the things that I want, but you can't do that here because select star does not make sense because there's all sorts of nested things and it doesn't know how to respond to that star query. Um, yeah, next. Um, we can flatten it and put it into a table just like what you're used to seeing, just a regular table, um, but we have to build structures like this, right? And that's cool and fine, but sometimes, like I said, the data in that JSON file will change over time. And so that means we got to come here and modify this, um, which is okay. I mean, that's what we got to do because you have to use it, but sometimes that happens a lot and um, it kind of jams up and gums up things um, and it changes things. And um, a lot of the warehouse users don't like change. So we got to make it consistent, keep everybody happy, um, Zach. So recently, so it's been uh, a year now um, as, as released um, for Redshift and other databases do this, by the way. There's some competitors to Redshift, which we use here like Snowflake and even the, the Microsoft, the SQL data warehouse, I think is what it's called. I mean, they do this as well. So it's not special to Redshift, but this is what Redshift does. With that data set I recently showed, I can create we can create a table that has two columns, metadata and body, right? And so, which were the two top level elements of that JSON that I showed, and that's it. And so also when data, this is a kind of a crude simplified example of what will be done, but this is how data is loaded into tables. And the, the kicker is this last piece on the bottom there, but it just says JSON auto. And what that means is it looks at the data, it looks at the JSON, and if there are column names that match the keys in that JSON, then it just magically slurps it into those uh, columns, right? So that data becomes available just like that. So on the ingestion side, not that that's the idea or the key to make it easy for ingestion, but it does make it a lot easier to get things in there. Um, and that way, even if the body changes, and in this particular data, the body does change, um, it's always there and available, okay? Um, so on the ingestion side, that makes things quicker to load. So if you were to come 
again, in this particular data type, there's two, uh, the data set, terminology I learned this morning, there are two columns. Um, the actual data set has 296. So um, if you were to come to a data warehouse person and say, can you load this table? It's got 296 columns. And by the way, sometimes they change and sometimes stuff is added and stuff becomes deprecated. Um, that becomes slightly nightmarish, but if it can be reduced to these two and allow for that variability in the actual content of the data, then that makes it easier to get in. But easier to get in, again, is not the goal, but quicker oftentimes for the analysts, for the SQL developers, for the report writers to look at that data, to be able to make sense of it, right? If 296 columns, I mean, that's going to take somebody probably weeks to figure out to get all the data types right, especially with this data, because it's um, large and spot. And anyway, um, or building something like this, you can get data in and into your hands as users quicker, quicker. And so that's where on the ingestion side, um, there is significant advantages. Zach. Yeah, so like Jason was mentioning, querying is actually super easy. Um, I know it seems super complex, everything that we've thrown at you up until now. Um, but if you want to take notes, I think this is probably the time, assuming that you're in the analyst role. Um, so it uses a syntax called particle um, pronunciation, not really uh, standardized as far as I can tell. Um, but it's very, very similar to SQL. It's just a slightly different dialect in the same way that uh, Postgres is different from SQL Server, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I've got a couple snippets here from my query uh, for the Office of Clinical Partnership to look at. Um, so this first one is going to be one that's pretty important. That set enable case sensitive identifier to true um, for I mean, depending on your data, data set. Um, but for this data set, a lot of the field values are capitalized. You can see sponsor name there is capitalized. Uh, paid SPA has got a bunch of capital letters in it. Um, and this is just an important thing to turn on if you have capitalization in your keys. Um, otherwise, it will not work um, is the short version of that. So make sure that you run that um, in your DB, for instance. But once you have run that in your little window, then everything else uh, should be good to go, at least for the rest of the session that you're using it for. Um, so we can see here um, that I've got a kind of a weird setup. It looks like I'm selecting from a table twice there, that aa.formdata.agreement ID, um, whereas I only have one thing in my from clause, which is the ASIN agreements, uh, abbreviated to AA. And that is pretty much exactly what's happening. Um, so I'm using the form data field basically as a table. Um, so that's the field that I showed earlier that has uh, the JSON object in it. That's the super data type field, one of them. Um, so yeah, it's almost exactly the same as just selecting out of a table. You just type in uh, the actual table and then the super data type, and then uh, the key of whatever it is you're looking for. Um, all of mine are in parentheses or in uh, quotation marks rather. That's because uh, it does not handle spaces very well. Uh, like if you were to type this without uh, quotation marks, the like SQL would not understand how to read it. Um, so I just threw quotation marks around all of mine just in case. Your results may vary. It depends sort of on who's setting up the form. Uh, the Office of Clinical Partnership, great group of people, but this is their first experience with data at this scale. Um, so doing stuff like keeping everything lowercase and not having spaces in field names, um, they're just not quite there yet. Uh, so like I said, it depends on your user group, whether you'll need to use that or not. Um, but yeah, it, like it, it really is this symbol. Then you get the value um, of the key that you typed in out of there. Uh, you can see I've got like a case statement in here real quick, depending on what the uh, the keys values are. That's, uh, that's a checkbox in Adobe sign. So it behaves a little differently. Um, but yeah, long story short, really not as complicated as we've probably made it sound up until right now. Um, so on the next slide here, we can see uh, there are also arrays. Um, so arrays are essentially a list of JSON objects. Um, so you can see me sort of go through the process here of selecting something out of uh, 
out of a super data type. Um, so we can see that first line is just me selecting webhook logs, the field. We looked at that a little bit earlier. We can see from the icon on the lower screenshot that it is still a super data type. Um, we can see it's got, uh, if you can see the, the JSON objects denoted by the curly braces. Um, we can see there's two of them in the screenshot here. There's a bunch more outside the screenshot, but I was hoping people might be able to read it. So I did not include them. Um, but yeah, so we can see that that is, uh, and then we can see by the square bracket on the far left of that, that this is uh, some, this is an array. Um, so the square bracket denotes an array, which is a list of JSON objects. And then the curly braces denote that it, it's a JSON object. We can see the comma here separating this first one, the agreement created one from the second one, agreement action completed. And then we can see the comma right there at the end, indicating that there are more. Um, so on this second line here, webhook logs, uh, and then the zero, that's just me selecting the first thing. Um, so for anyone who doesn't have a, a super nerd code background, computers start counting at zero. So if you select something at zero, that means it's the first thing. Um, so we can see here on the second row of the lower screenshot, I've got the agreement created and then the timestamp field. So that's the JSON object that is first in that array. Um, and now the line below that third line, uh, still selecting out of that first objects. Now I want the value associated with the key timestamp. Uh, and then that double uh, colon big int is me converting it to a number. Um, so we can see here, like when I took uh, this JSON on the second line, when I took it out of webhook logs and just selected the first element, it still is a super data type. Um, and actually, if we go back to the previous slide, we can see I'm declaring the data types here along the right side, varkar, 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 et cetera. Um, that's because if you select something out of a super data type without telling Redshift what data type you want it to be, it will assume that you still want it as a super data type. Um, so if you just want to be able to like read text in Beaver, not super important. Um, but if you want to take this data and put it into another tool where it is important for that tool to know what your data types are, then this is something you'll want to do. You'll want to figure out, you know, which of these is it supposed to be and then convert it. Um, so in this case, the value in the timestamp field, which we can see uh, is that 166362, blah, blah, blah. That is an epic timestamp. So the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. Um, it's a way that computers can keep track of time. Uh, and we know that we're going to want that uh, as a number. In this case, it's a long number. So big int, not just int for integer. Um, so we can see converting it to the timestamp field down here on the third line of the lower screenshot, we've now got that one, two, three on the left-hand side instead of that little box icon. So that's how we know, all right, cool, successful conversion from super type, super data type to the big int. Um, and then finally, this fourth line uh, is just a cool little snippet that will convert uh, that number of seconds since January 1st, 1970 into something that normal people can read. I don't know about you, but I don't really do that kind of math in my head. Um, so yeah, just converts it to an actual date timestamp. Uh, and that's what's here on the bottom. So, you know, if I'm building a query from scratch, this is the process that I'm going through in order to determine, you know, what do I want the end result of each field to be? Um, in my final query, I probably don't have all four of these fields because I don't really need the first three now that I've gotten to the date time field, which is what I'm after. Um, but that's just the general gist of, like I said, my process sort of going through there. Um, and then I, met, I did mention just a second ago, it's important to convert these into what you want them to be, the, the data types you want them to be if you're going to bring it into a different tool. Um, and that's where we get into, like I mentioned earlier, my tool of choice, which is Tableau. Um, so, you know, what's the important last step for this data? It's getting it into a dashboard, getting it into something that the Office of Clinical Partnership can search. Um, their sort of use cases, like I said, they do all of the uh, internships for credit, um, and they're required to report those to uh, a government agency every year. Um, and the way they used to do that was uh, just send an email out to all of the advisors who help students fill them out and say, hey, we need you to log into DocuSign and download all the ones that you did and type all of the relevant information into this Google Sheet. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I certainly would not relish a task like that. So I was super excited uh, when they came to me and wanted to know how they could modernize that a little bit. Um, so we were able to get their data into 
as Jason mentioned, the Redshift data warehouse. Um, and so now it is in a searchable dashboard for them. Um, super easy to do. Uh, once you've got your query all set up so that it's returning the fields that you want in the types that you want, uh, we can see on the bottom here, I've got agreement ID coming in as a varcar. Uh, term start date and term end date are both coming in as date fields. Perfect. Um, so there's no super types left in here. We don't have to worry about how Tableau is going to interpret them. Um, then we can just use the custom SQL button on the left-hand side of Tableau. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with that, if you're used to just picking your schema and dragging your tables, there is a button down there for custom SQL. Uh, if you whip something up in DBiver that you like, uh, you're able to plug it in there um, and Tableau will still be able to process it. Uh, it can be a little less performant, um, but unless you are dealing with you know, those massive tables that Jason was talking about, um, it's probably not going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, you just, you just throw it in there um, and then Tableau will treat it just like it's any other SQL table. Uh, I think that is all that we have. We've got, looks like about 15 minutes left. Uh, so if anyone has questions either over Zoom or in the room, I'm sure Jason and I would be happy to answer those. And let me summarize what we did. So we talked about this, why do we use super? Why do we care? It makes it easy to get it into. Well, for one thing, the JSON data is flexible. It has stuff, it doesn't have stuff and it changes. So this way you can access it all um, in that same uh, data type. Um, it's easier to get in quicker, um, but, uh, and then because depending on the data that you got, um, you can query it like you want. But so the expectation here is not that, um, what's, what's the first one? Is it a novice? What's the data citizen? If you're a data citizen, you're not expected to know how to uh, break out an array that's stored in the super data type. Um, but if you are, uh, if you want to get access to data quickly, uh, easily, you know what you're doing, you can go here. But this does not mean that it is the end. If you say, hey, we got this data, we, we, you got these two, two uh, columns right in that table, one was uh, metadata and one was buddy, but we really want, um, you know, these 25 written out that people will use regularly. Can you build, can you turn that into a table? So yeah, that, that would be the process, right? But at least all the data is there exposed. So it can be looked at and identified. Uh, Zach here was able to build his dashboard without needing to build any external tables or uh, secondary tables built off that. Um, so if you don't need it, then that's fine because sometimes the data really is straightforward, but um, maybe you do, or uh, you want to make it um, easier for your constituents, the people that you're building uh, content for to be able to query, then that obviously can be done, right? So you're not stuck with, like I say, figuring out how to parse through um, a variable number of array elements. And so that's, uh, I guess, the advantages of this super data type. Summarizing, Zach. Any questions, concerns? So this is, I think, the boos, the hisses, and the, and the I forget. No. Who thinks that they can use that? <laughs> uh, so data, I mean, I'm looking at you. Sorry, Jennifer, I don't mean to pick you up. But so PeopleSoft data doesn't, doesn't have this, right? I mean, there's none of this kind of stuff in PeopleSoft or Workday or some of those things. But a lot of the this new whiz bang stuff that people use that they would join to that data. I mean, there's most things that now have a API that needs uh, data fetched. This is the format that it's coming in. So this is the way it's, um, and uh, despite, uh, yeah, it's not, it wasn't named after me. Uh, Jason, Jason. Yeah, so this data, that the only, uh, I'm not sure. That in the beginning, that Adobe sign, the amount of data that they were putting in there was rest initially restricted to the OCP Office of Clinical Partnerships. Yeah, but I think there's all sorts going in there. It's a bit nightmarish because, like I say, you can put anything in there. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Yeah.
All right, cool. So if you see that, if you see, uh, that's kind of cool, Data D Beaver. I didn't know that it, it identified those kinds of things. But if you see weird and wacky stuff, just know that that's what it is. You're not, you know, nothing broke. The internet's still intact. Um, but just ask, ask somebody. We're hoping that people in the data and analytics area at least become uh, somewhat competent and at least understanding that this data does exist. But uh, feel free to reach out to at least Zach and myself and, and others if you need help with that. Thank you.